Welcome to Real Food Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America. This episode is brought to you by our friends at the University of Tennessee at Martin. UT Martin offers more than 100 academic areas of study within 18 undergraduate degree programs. Contact UT Martin today to find a program that's right for you. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emma, before I introduce our fascinating guest that we're already like jumping in and talking with, um, what is something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? Well, Scott, this week I discovered that the Cadillac V16 on display in the Transportation Gallery was originally built in the 1930s for the legendary comedian and silent film star W.C. Fields. Thank you, Emma. And that is actually, I'm I'm glad you picked that one. That's one I always show people uh, when I go through, because not only is it spectacular to look at, it's also interesting. You know, it has an interesting tie back to old Hollywood history. Did you know who W.C. Fields was before you found that fact, Emma? Be honest. Okay. Well, if I'm being honest, no, I did not. (laughs) But I do now. Thanks to Discovery Park of America. See, you discovered something Mm -hmm. at Discovery Park of America. I Um, did. So that's that's a good thing. Okay. My very special guest today is Dr. Debbie Reynolds. Welcome, Dr. Reynolds. Thank you. So nice to have you here. Um, You're a a veterinarian, but that doesn't really do enough to describe all the interesting things you do. You're also um, a podcaster and we can talk about all all those things. But um, before we get into it, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, where you grew up and uh, some of your motivations and how you ended up uh, doing this fascinating career. Well, very exciting. I grew up in Sharon, Tennessee which is um, just a little skip and jump away from Discovery Park of America. And do you, Um, and do you call, I noticed you called it Sharon. I've been told that, uh, you know, long timers call it Sharon. That's true. Is that true? true? Sharon. Yeah. Okay. Um, But you know, I got to fit in with the the general public. Sharon. (laughs) Um, So I grew up in Sharon and Sharon. And um, there were, in my graduating class, there were 32 people. So that kind of tells you how small it is. Um, We start kindergarten together and we uh, graduate high school together. So we're very close. Um, But I was born in Illinois um, and I came here in third grade. And my father passed away when I was four. And my mother's, her, her roots were in Sharon. So her family was here. And we tried to, you know, make it up in the Chicagoland area until I was eight. She made it another four years um, as a young widow. And then we came back home where she considers home. And so it was just, I have a brother. I had a brother. He recently passed away, but um, he was 10 years older than me. So I was eight. He was 18. And the Chicagoland was still home to him. So he went back. Um, He could not adapt to Sharon. (laughs) Um, So we stayed in Sharon and uh, it was just my mother and I for all these years. And um, I suppose I achieved upward mobility because no one in my family had even graduated high school. I was the first to even graduate high school. And then um, I ended up, um, I remember my mother took me of course we were a low-income family she took me to um take a test at west tennessee business college and if you achieved the highest score um you were offered a scholarship a full scholarship so she just drove me down there and i took this test and i don't know i won the scholarship and then on the spot you choose between four paths cosmetology legal assistant accounting and a fourth one, I can't remember what it was. So I'm like, um, legal assistant. So I chose that and um, I went to school for a year and I worked for Jim Bradbury, who's still our uh, juvenile judge of Wickley County today. Um, and I worked for him for 10 years. And 
um, which was a wonderful place to work. I worked for five of different attorneys at one point, um, all at the same time, a lot of them. They came in, okay, they came through Mr. Bradbury's law firm. Um, I was with him those whole 10 years, but he and some of the other attorneys really encouraged me to go after my dreams and become a veterinarian. So towards the end of that 10 year stint as being a um, legal assistant, I just bit the bullet and went to vet school. Wow. I mean, vet school is not easy. Um, and, and it's, uh, not everybody gets in and it takes a long time. And there was a, there was a little bit of me when I was growing up, um, my favorite, the first book series that I ever really, uh, connected with was all creatures, great and small. And so I read that whole series and it really kind of made me wanted to, to, to be a vet someday, but I wasn't good enough in, um, like the key science subject. So I didn't pursue that path, but, um, what, what do you suppose made your mom, what, what made her do that? Like take you there? What, what about her made her want to find opportunities for you? Well, um, looking back, you know, she always told me I could do anything or I could be anything and encouraged me. And, you know, I don't know if you read Hillbilly Elegy, but I studied some of that upward mobility. And one of the big differences I had was I had an encouraging uh, mother. And that was the biggest difference. And I think what probably pushed her to take me there was uh, poverty, lack of income and a chance for me to to have a full scholarship. So she just drove me my whole life. It's been like, what? Like I won that. And like when I got into vet school, um, like I didn't have, I just started as a non-traditional student. I had no advisor. I just looked at the list and it said, you take these classes to get into vet school. So I just started checking them off and I applied to vet school and I got in and you're just like, who does that happen to? You know, like, you know, it's just crazy. But when you were mentioned in the books, one of the books I read was Beautiful Joe. And I remember I was maybe third grade or so. That was one of the books and the series you mentioned, um, that book. And then I remember just studying uh, skeleton, the, the bones as a child, like just starting to study those things. And I was so inspired by those books. Um, but just thinking, well, I can't do that, you know it's um, too far away. It just seemed like I might as well be going to Japan as to go to vet school. You know, it's like so much money and so far away. And it's just me and my mom here and Sharon, how am I going to do that? But I don't know. We just, one of those, and then another story of my life, like how did, who does that happen to? And I just went down the list. I checked off the boxes and there I was in vet school. I mean, you know, the, I think the key is you started, you know, that's the most important thing is you got the list, you know, you started, your mom drove you there, you know, you, so you put, you put things in motion and then I, we're going to talk a little bit more about, you know, things in a minute, but I'm sure that you continued to work and work and work and cause it's not easy to pass those, those tests and everything. So your, your mom, how did your mom end up leaving Sharon in the first place? to live in Chicago. How did that happen? Well, I wrote her whole story. Um, when I was in UTM undergrad, uh, I took Margreta Alshwee's class and um, it was an opportunity for me to write her story. And I'm so appreciative of that because I don't have my mom anymore, but um, she, she's my grandfather ran the cotton gin at Sharon and they had a cotton farm. There was um, seven children. And the three oldest girls, of which my mom was the third from the oldest, went to the Chicagoland area. They literally um, got on the train. Um, My mom was in ninth. She was just leaving eighth grade. That's as far as she got. And they went to Chicago and they started working um, to bring money, to send money back home for the rest of the family to, to live. So they had three paychecks and two of the children would live on the paychecks where they were, and they would send one paycheck to the family. And they worked in a TV factory. They, none of them had ever even seen a TV or anything. And they lied on their application and said they were old enough to work there. And um, that's what they did. They did that, uh, as a lot of people did, to send money back home so the rest of the family could survive. 
It's amazing. And so that's where she met her husband, you know, his father. Yes. Um, wow. And then, and then came back. Well, that's, that's so impressive. So um, you were working um, as a, as a legal assistant and you were being exposed to all these different ideas and discovering all types of new things. Um, at what point, did you really, what was the tipping point at which you decided, you know what, I am going to go to vet school? Um, the tipping point was probably a cumulative effect. So Mr. Bradbury, whom I adore to this day, um, he, if most of, most people probably know him, he's been on the bench since the seventies. He's blind. Um, he was, um, he's amazing too. He was a construction engineer. He was in a hunting accident. He became blind and then he became an attorney. So also an inspirational story. Um, but he was a mentor to me. And for someone like him to think I was intelligent made me believe I was intelligent. And um, the attorneys that came through also, you know, always complimented me on that. And I thought, maybe I am, you know, so I started to have more confidence in myself. And the other, the tipping point really came from working with people that were unhappy. So all of the clients were in jail or fighting for custody or had a work injury and they couldn't pay their bills. And all every day was so stressful because you're working with people that are under incredible amounts of stress um, and you really can't do a lot to help them. And after even seven or so, or so years of that, I thought, I, I don't want to do this till I'm 65 or whatever. I don't think I'm, I'm going to be in this for the long haul. So um, I knew I was going to change course and I just decided to go for it. So, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who are doing their jobs right now and, um, who are like wishing they were doing something else and maybe even have a calling to do something else. And they're a little bit uh, nervous of trying something different. What, what was the first, you got to put one foot in front of the other. What was the first foot you put out there to explore going back to school? I took a night course at UT Martin. I was so scared. I asked my husband to take it with me. Um, I, he worked for UTM, so he could go free and I could go half price. I was like, please take this course with course with me. I'm old. I was only 26 or something, but I'm like, I'm so old. Um, can you go with me? So we took a Tuesday night course. Dr. William Lambert in uh, Milan taught it, and it was on animal companionship or something. It's kind of a fun course. And I was like, after I got my foot in the door, and my husband kind of held my hand and went to that first class with me. And I saw, you know, I got the registration done. I got everything done. I got in the door. Um, I took the class. I got on campus. I'm like, yeah, I can do this. Wow, that's amazing. And so that's how you got your undergrad. How long did it take you? Well, I went, I took that. It was called the two and a half year option. So like I said, I, che I literally checked off every class on that two and a half year option. I had that book. I opened it up and it said, take these classes and I took it and then you can apply to vet school. So then I applied to vet school. So I had no degree when I went into vet school. Um, but after my first year of veterinary college, um, I received a degree. I came back to UT Martin and received a degree and I got a bachelor of science in agriculture based on the credits I received in veterinary school. And so, um, did, did you also go to UT Martin's veterinary college? Is that where you went to veterinary school? I went to Knoxville. UT Knoxville. Uh -huh. Were you so able to travel back and forth or how did that work? No, um, we moved there and that was another, you know, when you're married, it's a lot more to consider and I remember one of the first things they, they told us, because I was an older student there too, um, that, you know, a lot of marriages don't survive. Um, I remember they told us that the, the very right off the bat, like this is going to be intense. A lot of marriages don't survive. And we had had that discussion. Do, um, does he want to stay here and, and me commute back and forth? It kind of lived there. And we decided to both go. Um, and he transferred from UT Martin to UT Knoxville and we just stayed there 
the whole four years together. Um, and it was intense, but, um, obviously we're still married and doing great. So <laughs> yeah. Did he get it? Did he, uh, resign his job and get a job there? Right. He, he kind of just transferred ever since, um, ever since then he has just transferred all around the system, um, okay. back and forth, uh, so from here to there and back. And what does he do? Right now, he is the director of maintenance for weekly county schools. So he's okay. transferred within the university system and the county school system, but he's always been within the school system. Oh, that's great. Um, so what, um, what, do you, what were your biggest challenges as an adult going back to college? Um, and at some point along the way, you're going to have children here. Um, did you, were you a mother yet by this, at this point? No. Um, we didn't have our first child. We were married 12 years before we had our first child. And that was, um, after I was back and practicing as a veterinarian. So, um, the biggest challenges, well, we had a major lifestyle change my second year in veterinary college where we became, um, Christians. So we, our, our lifestyle had a huge change for the better. Um, and after that change occurred, I would say that um, we probably, things became a lot more um, stable for us. So I would say the challenges, it really the challenge in veterinary school is they, they give you so much so fast and you have to do pharmacology and virology and radiology and surgery and internal medicine and all of these that are specialties as a general practitioner. So there's so many specialties coming at you so fast um, and just trying to keep up. And when you're in it, it seems like it's the world, like it's taking over your world. I know there are people that fell apart during those four years. And I don't want to make light of it because it's a big deal in the veterinary community. Um, there's a Facebook page called Not One More Vet because suicide is uh, increased risk in the veterinary profession. Part of that's because we have access to drugs and um, the amount of stress that we're under and compassion fatigue and things like that. And that starts occurring in veterinary school. So um, I would say just the amount of stuff coming at me, but being married made it better. Um, definitely having someone um, there. And um, my dog, Bentley, oh man, that dog sat with me all day and all night. I had this little dachshund and he was just my lifeline through that time. He, um, just having him there for me when I was studying through the wee hours of the night and in the morning and having him there. Um, I hear this story time and time again, too, about how a dog, the companionship of a dog can really get you three times. And my little Bentley, he was, he was a lifeline for me. Yeah. I've got, as you and I talked earlier, um, I've always had dogs, but I've got one now that is just like my companion Coco. Um, she's, uh, part pit bull. Um, but she is like my wife and I, if we're in the house sitting down, she is a big dog, but she is literally snuggled up on top of us. You know, I mean, she loves to snuggle and if I'm anywhere, I take, I take her with me everywhere I can. So, um, anyway, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but, um, I was curious. I'm glad you, you answered that. Were there other dogs in your childhood and throughout before you got to Bentley that sort of also inspired your desire to be a vet? Yes. Um, my mother often had, I begged for dogs. We got dogs. And this is why I will never be a veterinarian that says, if you can't afford a dog, you shouldn't get a dog. I will never say that to anyone because that breaks my heart when I see people shame people that they may not have enough money um, to do everything for a dog because a dog needs love and a home. Um, if you can't afford elite medical care, um, I don't think someone should be shamed into not owning a dog. There are lots of dogs that don't even have a home or love, but um, I won't get on that soapbox, but um, I was that girl. I was that girl that couldn't, you know, if my dog um, 
needed a hip replacement. We couldn't afford a hip replacement. Does that mean I shouldn't have a dog? No, I can, I should, I can have a dog. We, I had many dogs that I loved. Um, one of my first childhood's dog was, her name was Sis. I had one, the first dog I had, I named Love, L-U-V. Um, mm-hmm. And that was one of my, my heart dogs. Um, but I had several dogs growing up. And um, by the time we left for vet school, my husband and I had four dogs. And we were able to take two with us and my mom and his mom kept the other ones. But yes, I had um, dogs and a few cats growing up. Oh, that's, that's incredible. We, I've had a life of dogs and, you know, so I've, I've gone, been going to vets my whole, um, my whole life, childhood through um, adulthood. And so I've had both good vet stories and bad vet stories or experiences. I've had good and bad experiences with um, all different types of vets. And so we're going to talk a little bit when we get back from the break about veterinary uh, services and, and, and how people who have pets should best interact with vets. And we want to hear more about some of the different things that you're doing in veterinary medicine. So we'll be right back after this break. Hundreds of students experience real-world learning at UT Martin. Faculty members pair students with the perfect internship, clinical, or educational placement that best suits their area of study. Visit utm.edu to learn more about UT Martin. I hope you're enjoying Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast catcher of choice. It helps more people learn about what we have going on here in West Tennessee. Our guest today is Dr. Debbie Reynolds, and we're going to talk a little bit more about um, her life as a veterinarian. Um, But first, I have to ask you about your name. Um, How often uh, do people make jokes with you about the movie star Debbie Reynolds? Well, not as much anymore. And if they (laughs) do, they're older. Um, The kids anymore, they don't know. But um, older people, they love it. Yeah, I mean, I have a hard time remembering names, but I will go to my grave remembering your name, um, which is good because I'm going to start using you as my vet. So I got to um, I got to be able to awesome. remember Dr. Debbie Reynolds. Um, a lot of a lot of people younger than me might remember her more as Princess Leia's mother. But um, that is really neither here nor there. Let's talk a little bit about uh, taking care of our pets. You're doing some really interesting things that I'm fascinated by, including holistic animal care fear-free uh, veterinary care and, and animal aromatherapy. Um, do you have like a, a, a philosophy on taking care of pets? Well, it's all evolved. You know, when I was in veterinary school, they don't teach any of this. So that's why most vets don't know about it. Um, you have to go and get it. It's the extra. So there's, when you're in veterinary school, you're sponsored by Hills, Science Diet, Purina, all of the mainstay um, big name places. They, they give your dogs free food um, for the time you're in school. They sponsor your lunch and learns. And in the, the um, I don't know what to call it, we'll call it typical, the typical um, conferences they're all sponsored by heart guard or whoever the the big money bayer pfizer whoever so um all of that stuff is there and that's who sponsors it and that's what you learn about so it's like um kidney disease um same old same old same old here's a new drug the end and so eventually you start to wonder is there more is there something else out there And so, um, and then a lot of us have had a life experience that that takes us in that direction, um, looking for the more, what else is there? And then, you know, you have that one-year-old Labrador that has hip dysplasia, and then you have to put them on pain medication, and he's going to live hopefully to be 12 to 15 years old. Well, you know, most likely he's going to end up having um, stomach ulcers, liver disease from taking this medication that long. And you have to think what there's got to be something else. So um, that was the the 
the catalyst that made me question, you know, there's got to be something else. So um, the first thing I looked into was aromatherapy. And I found a veterinarian that was doing that, Dr. Melissa Shelton. And I just started pestering her. Um, I just started uh, following her and asking her questions. And like now she knows me. Um, I'm just that kind of person. I'm just going to like get on somebody's radar, um, whether they want me to or not. And then I started following her on the, the conference circuit. So when I started following her on the conference circuit, it took me to Birmingham, Alabama, no, Augusta, Georgia. Uh, I went to Augusta, Georgia, and she was speaking at the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association, which I hadn't really heard of and didn't know about. But when I went there, whoa, that was where all the light bulbs went on. Um, I took intro to everything intro to acupuncture, intro to chiropractic, intro to homeopathy, intro to herbs, intro to everything. Um, I met Dr. Shelton um, and I, and the people there, the, the lecturers were so welcoming and so um, they were eager to teach. It wasn't like the other conferences I went to where they were untouchable. Um, these people were approachable and helpful. So that conference is what started everything. You know, I, I'm, I think about, you know, my veterinary experiences and veterinarians have a calling. So no offense to any veterinarians out there in the world, but I know a lot of my dogs in the past have been unnerved by the experience of having to go to the vet. First of all, you know, there's the smell of a thousand different, you know, animals in there and the panic and the, you know, and I had one dog, Sophie, who, uh, you know, was our family dog for about 15 years. And she hated the vet so bad that eventually we had to get a tranquilizer to give her before we could even take her to the vet just for a checkup to be able to get her heartworm medicine and everything. And, you know, she would claw on the floor to keep from going into the door as soon as she knew where she was going and it just broke your heart. So when it came time for us to have to uh, put her down, um, you know, I was just, it was so hard for me to have to take her there where she hated so much, you know, to, so, so how, how does what you do differ, you know, from traditional veterinary medicine? Oh, in probably every way. And I have to say that was, before I found holistic medicine, when I first came out of veterinary college um, and I went to work as an associate, that was a real wake up call for me because I would walk into an exam room in my, I feel like I've gone from white collar to blue collar. That's what I call it. I was in, you know, dress clothes and a starched white coat. Um, and I was clean all day and now I'm wearing scrubs. I got hair, possibly poop or vomit. Um, I'm in a work van. Like I love what I do now, but before I was very clean and proper, I would walk in, I would see the dog, which was trembling on a stainless steel table and they hated me before I even touched them. And then people were holding them, restraining them. And I would do what I had to do. And I walked out and I thought, this is not what I signed up for. Like every pet hates me. Like what happened? So that was also a wake up call for me. I'm, or I would be doing surgery all day and I would, I would walk into a pet that was asleep and on a table and do surgery and walk out. I had no relationship with animals at all. So when I switched over to house calls, um, and it was really that holistic vet med conference that taught me, I, it was then that I started the road to the path to fear-free medicine, hospice and palliative care. I'm certified in that. I'm certified in aromatherapy. I'm certified in fear-free, um, and I'm certified in chiropractic. So I, I found all that there, but that took me obviously years to get all those certifications. But fear free was one of the first things I was already doing fear free. I just didn't know what to call it. So when I started doing house calls, um, I don't restrain animals anymore. I can't remember the last time I've restrained an animal. And, so, and for, for our listeners, um, the way that uh, do you do you have an office or do you only work out of your van going to people's houses? 
I only work in people's uh, homes. So there's a house call vet and there's a mobile vet and I'm a house call vet. Mobile vets have a van they work in and house call vets work in the home of the patient. So um, I only work in their homes and I do have a shop, a pet shop where my office manager is and I have um, holistic products that we sell and I can do chiropractic and things like that in there, but it's not inspected to be a clinic and I can't do work there. Okay. So, um, I, um, interrupted you. So, um, th thank you. I think that helps people understand that, that, you know, you're actually going into people's houses to perform veterinary care. Right. And sometimes I have people that are not within my area that meet me at, you know, someone else's home or, um, sometimes in a parking lot. I don't know. I like it defeats the whole purpose of the house call, but sometimes I have people that insist on doing that for whatever reason. So, um, yeah, so we're at the pet's home and fear-free medicine really involves, um, I want the dogs to think of me as children think of the ice cream man. So when, when I pull up, most of the time, they're very happy to see me. They're getting treats. Um, we have lick mats. We put cheese on. We find out what their what their what their um, equity is. What they love. It, maybe it's a belly rub. Maybe it's um, cheese. Maybe it's peanut butter. Whatever it is that pet loves. So fear free involves making a lot of notes, learning what an animal loves, um, finding out what their valuable thing is, and doing it. Um, Individ it's very individualized and so whatever they love is what we do and then they're happy when they see us and then if, especially if we can get them as a puppy um, it's very easy to develop that relationship because as a puppy they're busy eating cheese we're trimming their nails and giving vaccines and they don't even know that they've had anything done so they start to recognize us as the ice cream man or the dog treat ladies but if they've already had some experiences it takes a while to build up their trust and dogs are just like people. There are some dogs that are just innately more nervous than other dogs. You have a two-year-old Labrador, they don't care. But if you get a, you know, three-year-old Chihuahua, they're innately more nervous. It just takes a little more time to build that relationship. But um, if you build that relationship and if they understand, even if I'm offering them treats and they don't want it, they still understand your intent. Um, rather than just putting them on a table and restraining them and getting it done. Um, if we have to spend, you know, 20 minutes talking to them, letting them approach us, we'll do whatever it takes to try to develop a relationship with them. Um, and then, um, you know, I'm assuming that you then um, become the person with whom the pet owner has a relationship with and you you get calls all the time on you know the, the dog is not eating or you know the dog cut his or herself things like that yes yeah we fall in love with um the people so one thing i noticed when i transitioned from associate in a clinic to a house call practitioner was that i remember i had i can remember a specific client that I had seen in this practice for five years. And I went to one house call visit and I knew more about him in one house call visit than I knew about him in five years, seeing him several times a year in that clinic. You just develop relationships. It's a relationship-based business. Um, you develop relationships with the people, you develop relationships with the pets. I can only see eight to 12 a day so part of that means, you know, my attention is devoted and focused solely on that person. There's not three people in the waiting room. There's not, you know, people, you know, I'm not stressed out because people are waiting. Um, it just, it just works out better. And the relationships I build are what mean something to me. It's not for everybody, but for me, that's what is the most valuable part of my business. Oh, that's incredible. I'm so loving uh, talking to you about this. Um, one of the ways that you're getting the word out about um, what you do is through your own podcast. Um, you, you recently started that. Um, what, what's your motivation uh, for doing that? Um, and how's it going? Well, I have, it's kind of an interesting story. So I did a, a class on, um, 
the holistic healthy dog class. And it was to teach people how to be an educated consumer and pick products, pick supplements and good products for your dogs um, wherever you buy them. Um, because over and over again, I would go to a house call and I'd say, oh, I'm giving this. Um, and I'd be like, oh, that's not the right dose. It's not the right supplement. It's not third party tested. So I developed this class. And when I listen to myself on that class, I'm like, man, I am so country. So, <laughs> and then I tried to change the way I was. I was saying arthritis, you know, and I was like, arthritis, arthritis. And then I'm like, okay, I'm just going to call myself the Simply Southern Vet. I just can't, I can't change myself that much. So it's called the Simply Southern Vet podcast. And I just am what I am. I'm a Simply Southern Vet. Um, and, you know, the things that set me apart are it's, I'm faith based. Um, so a lot of our stories have to do with uh, miraculous um, things that have happened with pets that we've prayed for. Um, it has to do with a life journey that I've been on with um, as a parent with a daughter with special needs um, and as a parent of three children and um, everything about our business, the in-home euthanasias and anything that's um, going on. Uh, so the challenge was I was doing a marketing course and they said, you've got to find your voice. You've got to just get out there and start using it. I guess it's another example of just start. So I'm like, okay. And I started doing a thing called God stories on my YouTube channel. And I just couldn't get myself to look good every day and get on in front of a video. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to a podcast. So we started the Simply Southern Vet podcast and it's stories about our nonprofit Keeper's Mission or, um, house calls we've had that day or just different stories um, that we that's been going on in veterinary home health care. And um, the challenge was to use my voice every day and just get used to it. And there's not very many subscribers. And, you know, honestly, I was totally fine with that. I was so embarrassed. I'm like, man, I hope nobody listens to this podcast, <laughs> but I'm just putting it out there all the time and um, getting braver and braver with everyone. Well, hey, I'm I'm a subscriber and I listen to it. I look forward to it when I see a new one's popped up. Um, I know recently you talked about um, uh, going to uh, help treat animals um, in a, in Jackson, maybe of homeless people. Yes. Um, I mean, I found that to be so uh, inspiring, you know. And and I've and I'm guilty of being one of those people that sees a dog with a homeless person, and I think you know that's terrible that that homeless person has a dog. But you've made me change the way I think about that. Why don't you just touch on that a little bit? Oh, good. Um, yes. And part of that comes from my background too. But um, if you think about it, um, that that pet, well, like, you know, I talked about my heart dog and we call them heart dogs, that dog you had that, you know, you had that really special relationship with. And if you are homeless um, for whatever reason, um, that is your, your lifeline, you know, that dog. And I will tell you that all of the pets of the homeless that I've met are treated better than the person. That person will give that dog food before they will eat. Um, and there are people like me that help take care of those dogs. They receive care. I've never seen one that was just terribly sick or terribly neglected. Um, and I want to be a part of that to help take care of them because I know what an important emotional support those dogs are. And when I went to the homeless shelter um, in Jackson, there were, I don't know, 20 men there. And there were only two dogs in that shelter, but those dogs were the light of that shelter. They brought light to every individual that was there. And I'm sure it diffused a lot of the, um, whatever was going on there, whatever stressors were there to have Happy and Bella there, I can guarantee you made things brighter. Um, but the reason there's a, I don't think that was my podcast. I think it was in my God stories, but, um, it was because of a client that I started that nonprofit. He, he's passed away of pancreatic cancer. His name is David Bayer. He was one of, this is another example. I only know him from house calls. His dog's name is Keeper and that's why it's called Keeper's Mission. Um, and David, this was his heart's desire. 
And I ended up taking him to Nashville to minister. He's a pastor to minister to the homeless on Second Avenue. And I was scared to death. I'm like, what are we going to do? He was so sick when we went. He was so sick and weak. And I nobody would take him. So I'm like, uh, I'll take you. And um, when I realized the homeless people had pets there, I'm like, oh, this is how it all started. I'm like, I'm going to put on a backpack and I'll take care of their pets. And that way they'll welcome us and they won't, you know, reject us. And that's how it all started, just with um, one of those trips, crazy trips. And then we developed this nonprofit and we've been starting to really move forward with it. Oh, that's incredible. Um, I am uh, feeling um, more positive about humanity just spending a few minutes with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, before we go, um, I, I because we're Discovery Park of America, and we're all about inspiration and discovery. Uh, can you think of one thing you can share with us that you've discovered in your life that you think has contributed in a positive way to who you are today? Well, I mean, hands down, um, yes, it was that instant moment when I accepted Christ um, in October of 1998. That changed everything for me um, because I was not such a positive person before then. Um, It just, it was like walking from the darkness into the light. And I'm not one of those um, I knew nothing about God. I knew nothing. I did not believe in it. I thought it was rubbish and trash and ridiculous. I mean, and no one came up to me and ministered to me. And um, it's just kind of a crazy story, too. I just started having thoughts and and which I now know was probably, you know, not just thoughts. But um, then I had a friend of mine pass away young at 24 and um, just started searching, just started going and looking different churches. And then I just kind of asked, you know, you know, if you're there, you know, what just tell me, you know, what is there more? And when I went from darkness to light, that was the one thing that changed everything for me in that moment in October of 1998. And that changed the whole trajectory of my life. Um, and my husband was with me and he accepted Christ that day too. We were both kind of walking in darkness and we changed both on that day and everything about our path changed right then. Um, so that would be the one thing that changed everything for us. Wow. That is incredible. Um, if, if people want to, uh, find out more about if, first of all, if people want to, get a checkup for their dogs or they, if they want to get you to their house to treat their dogs, which uh, I'm going to, um, how's the best way for them to track you down? How do we find you? Well, there's a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> our Facebook page is Veterinary Home Healthcare, and that's we're really active on that. You can um, just Google Veterinarians Martin, Tennessee, if you don't have anything to write with. I'll pop up. Um you can brandy is at the shop and she is um you can if you google me you'll see our our web page veterinaryhomehealthcare.net you can make an appointment on there you can um make it through our email you can just call old-fashioned phone call 819-5149 um, or you can text that number if you're a uh, young person, don't like to talk to people. And, um, or you can Facebook message. And we've got Instagram also. Um, so website, Facebook, Instagram, text, uh, website, call. We try to keep up with all of it. And they should also, everybody should download your podcast and give it a listen, I think. Oh, boy, the pressure's <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today uh, to talk with us. I know that you have inspired as many people out there as you have inspired me today. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoy this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you may be listening. 
plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.